Um, yeah, we've got uh, a great study. We've been off for the last two weeks, so thank you for being so faithful to be back here. And we'll be here next week, uh, next Thursday. So we're, we're going to continue to go through the book of 1 John together, which is a great book. Ford's back there yawning, so... Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I do need to say this, the second this is over, I've got to immediately dash and head to the airport. And you can pray for me. I'm, I'm preaching this afternoon to 7,000 people. Um, and John MacArthur is there, and I'm preaching on the cross, and John 19, and uh, a walk through the uh, a survey of the cross. And so, and then I'll preach Saturday um, afternoon be the closing speaker for the conference on the resurrection of Christ. And so it's, it, it really is an extraordinary opportunity uh, to preach the Word of God. And then I head to the airport and fly to Charlotte and then from Charlotte to Cleveland and we'll preach a couple more times there. But I'll be back <laughs> in time for our Bible study. And uh, so, Luke, thank you so much. No problem. This is Luke Stainback, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> working his way through college by <laughs> bringing us Herb's House coffee. So, yeah, and people ask me as I travel around, uh, so where does Herb live? <laughs> How would I find Herb's house? <laughs> so we are, just for point of clarification, we are in Herb's house. For those of you watching, wherever you are, it is a coffee shop here in Dallas. And we're very close, uh, about a block away from the Bush Presidential Library and very close to SMU. And so you're welcome to come to the study, you know, whenever you can. We've got a room packed full of high-powered theologians uh, in this room right now for this Bible study. And I'm eager to, to dig into the Scripture with you. So I wish I could stay afterwards and, and be able to talk with you, but we'll do that next week, okay? So let's just dive right into this, and I need to begin in a word of prayer. So, Father, as we come to your word, we ask that you would renew our minds, that you would ignite our hearts for you, that you would capture our wills and direct uh, our steps. Uh, teach us this day uh, the truth of your word. I pray for these men who have gathered here with me. It becomes such an integral part of my life and a blessing to me. I just ask that you would multiply your, your grace in their lives as a result of this time together. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're in 1 John chapter 2. And today we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. And we'll see if we can get through this because there's really a lot of truth. And it's, I, I really want us to grasp what John is presenting to us. The title of this is The Expedience of Obedience, or it could be titled, Obedience is Not Optional. So I want to begin by, by reading these verses. Beginning in verse 3, By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. The one who says... I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. In this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In these verses, we see the third test for true assurance of salvation. Uh, we have already seen the first two. The first one was that you have come to put your faith and trust in the true Christ. The Christ who was from the beginning. Eternal God. Uh, the Christ who became man that we heard and saw and touched that you have believed not in a Christ of your own imagination, uh, not in a Christ that Paul calls in Galatians 1, 
uh, a false Christ, but that you have come to believe in the one true Christ sent by the Father into this world, born of a virgin who lived a sinless and perfect life, went to the cross, died bearing the sins of his people, was buried, raised from the dead, has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That Christ. So to believe in any other Christ is to have a false hope. So that's the first test that we saw. That was in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The second test was in chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 2, and it is that you confess your sins to God. Uh, you, you're not an, an, an excuse machine making excuses for mistakes in your life, but that you realize that you have sinned and you are grieved about your sin and you bring your sin to God and you acknowledge your sin. And you do so at the point of entrance into the kingdom, and you do so as you continue to live the Christian life. There is a heightened sense of sin in your life, and it doesn't go away. In fact, the, the longer you walk with the Lord, the, the greater is your sensitivity to sin in your life, because you are growing closer to the one who is the light. And as you are growing closer to the one who is the light, you see the moral imperfections in your life with a greater sensitivity. So that's the second uh, test that John gives. So we now come to the third test. And in the book of 1 John, there is a, a series of, of tests, uh, some eight or nine, depending upon how you, you, you break it up that will be, will be realized in the life of everyone who is truly born again. Um, ultimately, the greatest assurance of salvation comes from your seeing a changed life in you, a, a life that only God could change, that you know that God is at work in your life because you see how you are being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. You can fake walking an aisle. You can fake praying a prayer. You can fake joining a church. You can fake being baptized. You cannot fake a changed life from the inside out. And so that's the case that John is making. Wherever there is the, the root of regeneration, and when we say regeneration, we mean the new birth. Wherever there is the root of regeneration, there will be by necessity the fruit of sanctification, which is growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To put it another way, whenever you go through the narrow gate, by necessity, you have to go down the narrow path. You cannot go through the narrow gate and then walk the broad path. It's just impossible. That is the, the theological argument that John is making. Faith alone saves, but faith that is alone does not save. True saving faith will always be accompanied by good works. So I hope that, that I've been able to make that clear. So we come now to the third test, and, and it's, it's pretty strong. So buckle your pew belt, okay? That this is going to be an R-rated Bible study. R for Reformed, okay? <laughs> so here we go. It is the acid test of obedience to the Word of God that there is a desire in your heart to obey the Word of God. And if that's not there, you're not saved. You're just fooling yourself. In the heart of every new believer and old believer is a new heart that desires to please God. 
that desires to walk in obedience. We do not walk in obedience perfectly. Let me just get that out on the table. That's why the second test is confession of sin. We wouldn't even have to confess our sin if we could obey God perfectly, right? So we will continue to, to disobey at times. We will confess it and make it right with God. But this is not talking about the perfection of our life. It's talking about the direction of our life. You're now on a new path of obedience to God. And when you're not obedient, you're grieved about it. And when you are obedient, there is a sense of pleasure that you derive from following the path that God has marked out. So that's what we're talking about. So, as we walk through this now, uh, obviously I have some headings, and it'll make it very simple. The first is the test stated. Let me ask you this. I, I did read the passage, didn't I? Okay, all right. I, I'm still on an airplane someplace, so. Um, all right. In verse 3, I want you to see the test stated. Let me just read it again. By this we know that we have come to know Him, if we keep His commandments. That's not hard to understand. Maybe hard to swallow, but it's not hard to understand. It says what it means, and it means what it says. Now, let's just walk through this. Please note the first word is and. That connects this with what preceded. This is one more in a series of tests. And by this we know. I just want to remind you, the word know is, is the most frequently used word in the First John. It's the key word. It's only five chapters in First John. It is used 40 times. 40 times. This is all about, this is a book all about knowing that you know the Lord. This is a book about assurance. The Gospel of John is about how to be saved. 1 John is how to know that you're saved. Okay? So the two go together perfectly. So verse 3, and, we, and by this we know that we have come to know Him. What that means is, by this you have the assurance that you're a true Christian. By this you know that you've been born again. By this you know that you are a genuine, authentic follower of Jesus Christ. And this is very important because you can't really live your Christian life to any degree of effectiveness if you don't know that you know the Lord. You've got to know that you know the Lord. And you've got to have a valid means by which you know that you know the Lord. So he says, and by this we know that we have come to know Him. To put it another way, by this we know that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is a pretty important subject we're addressing here because there are so many people in so many churches who are self-deceived into thinking that they know the Lord when in reality they do not know the Lord. Um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 7, verse 21. I think there are more people who are self-deceived about where they are with the Lord than there are people who actually know the Lord. So this, this is very important. So here's the test now as we come to it in the middle of verse 3. If, here's the condition, if we keep His commandments... Now, we do not keep His commandments in order to be saved. We keep His commandments because we have been saved. And it will always accompany true salvation. So you can look in the mirror and look in your own life and just, you ask the hard question. Am I living in obedience to the Word of God? Um, is it important to me to keep the commandments. Is this marginal and optional in my life, or is this really obligatory in my life? Because in the heart of a true Christian, according to John here, 
we will keep his commandments. Now, let, let's just walk <clears throat> through this. To keep his commandments means more than knowing his commandments. It means more than memorizing his commandments. It means more than studying his commandments. It means more than uh, cherishing or even witnessing and telling others about his commandments. It actually means to hold on to his commandments in such a way that you live them. In other words, these commandments are not going in one ear and out the other. That these commandments have gripped your heart and they now become the steering wheel of your life. They now become the rudder of your ship. The, the, these commandments now are the GPS in your spiritual life. And you are tracking with, with, with these commandments. That's what the word keep means, that, 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 you, that you hang on to them and that, that you observe them. Now, please note the word commandments. It, it, it's not God's suggestions. It, it's not God's preferences. It's not His opinions. It's not His options. These are God's commandments. And this word commandment, I, I looked it up, it means a charge that comes from a superior, like a superior officer. We are the lesser, God is the greater, and we are under His authority, and His word comes to us as an order, as, as an order from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It, it comes to us with imperatival force that grabs our conscience. And it, it is an injunction that requires the choice of our will to follow what is set forth in, in His Word. Also, please note that commandments is in the plural if we keep His commandments. And the idea here is a comprehensive scope of His commandments that we can't go through and, and, and just pick and choose which commandments I like and which ones fit me and pass on the others. No, no, no. It, it's, it's an across-the-board uh, allegiance and loyalty to the Lordship of Christ to keep all His commandments. And this is true for every single Christian. And this is nothing new. Je Jesus has already affirmed this in the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, you remember, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, verse 18. With this authority, He has the authority to command us, right? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we come to verse 20. Teaching them to observe all, all that I commanded you. And that's the role of the church. That's the role of discipleship. That's the role of the pulpit. That's the role of the teacher's lectern, to pass down all these commandments that Christ gave to his disciples, it, it, it is to be like this domino effect or a relay race. They are to be passed down from generation to generation, and they are to come with binding force upon our lives. Now, let, let me be quick to say this. The greatest thing that you and I can do is to obey his commandments. Every commandment points us into the very epicenter of the will of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God. So this isn't like taking bad medicine in order to get well, something I just have to put up with and do. No, every commandment is leading you into the abundant life that is in Jesus Christ. And every step of disobedience is harming you and hurting you and exposing you 
to the world, the flesh, and the devil. So, as we think about obedience to His commandments, don't think about it as a negative. Think about it as an, an extreme positive on steroids, because it is. It, it, it's pinpointing you into the center of God's will, which Romans 12 verse 2 says is good and acceptable and perfect. You, you cannot improve on God's will as revealed in His commandments. So, let me just give you now a couple of words to help flesh out this before we move on. Concerning this obedience, it should be, number one, immediate. This isn't something that kicks in 10 years after you become a Christian. This isn't something that starts five years after you're born again and you decide to get serious about God in your life. No, this happens the moment you walk through the narrow gate. You were born again. You can measure that by when you began to walk in obedience to the Lord. I mean, this, this starts the second, not perfectly again, and you're, you're probably going to have to learn what all these commandments are. But nevertheless, that's what repentance is. I mean, you turned away from going your own way and going according to the course of this world, and you now are on a new path headed in a new direction to follow the clear teaching of Scripture. So this starts immediately. There is no such thing as a genuine testimony that says something like this. You know, I accepted Jesus as Savior when I was 10, but I didn't make Him Lord until I was 22. That, that is the most bogus testimony you'll ever hear in your life. Number one, you're not qualified to make Him Lord. Only God the Father can make Him Lord. So no one makes Him Lord. He already is Lord. You recognize His Lordship and you submit to His Lordship. Second thing is Lord and Savior is a package deal. You don't get half a Jesus when you're 10 and the other installment of Jesus when you become 21. That, it doesn't work that way. It's all or nothing. Jesus is Lord and Savior. And the first step of obedience is really the first step through the narrow gate that leads you into the kingdom of God. The second thing I want to tell you is not only immediately, but willingly. D don't think that now this is being, and I used the word earlier, forced, because it does come with powerful force, but don't think that this is against your will. No, God's given you a new heart, and He's given you a new will. In fact, your will is only the servant and handmaiden of your heart. You, your will will only choose what your heart wants to do, okay? And so it's really a matter of the heart. And you, you will willingly obey the Lord, not against your will, but according to the desires of your heart. Um, Romans 6, verse 17 says, You became obedient from the heart. True obedience is from the heart because you desire to obey. When Jonathan Edwards wrote what is arguably his magnum opus was called the freedom of the will. His whole argument was really the bondage of the will, but his whole argument was your will will only choose to do what your heart wants to do. So the key is your heart. Every decision is flowing out of your heart. And so that's why we must keep our heart pure and clean. So the third thing I would tell you is that this obedience is long-term. It, it, it endures throughout the entirety of a Christian life. You don't start out for the first 10 years living in obedience, and then the last 30 years you just go AWOL and kind of go your own way and do your own thing, etc. No, no, no. Jesus, Hebrews 12, verse 2, is the author and perfecter of faith. He authored saving faith, and he matures and perfects the obedience of faith in you throughout the entirety of your Christian life. Philippians 1, verse 6, He who began a good work in you shall perfect it. 
until the day of Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2, verse 13, that, that God is at work within you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And in the heart and soul of everyone who is genuinely born again, there is this work of God, this work of Christ, this work of the Holy Spirit inside of you that by which you continue to pursue obedience. You don't just check out for a decade and then come back. No, God, God has a way of bringing you back. It's called discipline uh, if you're a true child of God. Now, this is what's known as the perseverance of the saints. I know you've heard of that, that doctrine, the perseverance of the saints. The perseverance of the saints means more than the eternal security of the believer, once saved, always saved. That is true, but the perseverance of the saints goes even further. And it says, not only will you never fall away from grace, but that for the rest of your Christian life, you will be growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, which means you will be becoming progressively being made more and more and more like Christ. And it's not because of you, it's because of Christ in you. And He will never let go of you. And He will continue to build up your faith. And so it will be a lifelong pursuit of obedience to the will of God. So that, that's, that's, what, that's what John is teaching here. And I, and I wish I had time. I've got a note card here with about literally 18 cross-references to take you to the whole Bible, and we would never finish the book of 1 John if I go, go off on that. But the entire Bible supports what I just told you. Now, I want to I add a footnote right here before we move to the next verse. I can hear someone say this, and I hear it occasionally. You're just teaching legalism. Obedience is legalism. I'm free in Christ to live however I want to live. I don't know if you've heard that. It's very sad. It comes from untaught teachers and preachers. Let me define for you what legalism is. It's a two-fold prong. Number one, legalism is telling people to obey a list of rules that are not found in the Bible. So if you're a good Christian, you're going to sit on the fourth row of the church and your hair will be whatever length and your dress will be whatever length and you won't do this and you won't do that and you won't do this and you won't do that and if that's the case, your dog spots the best Christian you know because he doesn't do those things either. But it is coming up with a list that has no chapter and verse for it whatsoever, and it's imposed upon your Christian life. That's legalism. The second aspect of legalism is telling people they have to keep the Word of God in order to be saved. And no one can be saved by their works. John is not talking about either one of those. He's not talking about working your way into the kingdom, and he is not talking about keeping a list of rules that are not found in the Bible. He's talking about keeping God's commandments, and that is a necessary part of every true Christian's life. I'll just give you one cross-reference. I mean, I'm just dying to give you these, this list of 18, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. All right, I know when you're laughing with me, and I know when you're laughing at me, okay? <laughs> um, but John 7, 21. Well, I mean, let, let's just put that card on the table. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Did you get that? Jesus just defined who went through the narrow gate and who's going down the narrow path. It's not the one who says, Lord, 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 Lord. It's the one who behind that profession is the possession 
of Christ, and you keep the commandments of God. Not because you have to.